Hi, welcome to day seven, the final day of my special Amber Limwick series of videos. Today is, of course, the anniversary of Queen Anne Boleyn's execution on the 19th of May, 1536. So I'm paying tribute to her by telling you about that tragic day. At 8 a.m. on the 19th of May, 1536, Sir William Kingston, Constable of the Tower of London, informed Queen Anne Boleyn that her execution was imminent. Anne was prepared. She dressed with care, wearing an ermine-trimmed outfit signifying her royal status and a crimson kirtle, the colour of martyrdom, topped with a traditional English gable hood. On the scaffold, she delivered a brief speech adhering to the protocol for executions. Chronicler Edward Hall documented her words. Good Christian people, I am come hither to die. For according to the law and by the law, I am judged to die and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak anything of that whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king and send him long to reign over you. For a gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never, and to me he was ever a good, a gentle and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of the world and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O Lord, have mercy on me. To God I commend my soul. Charles Risley also recorded her speech, noting she spoke with a goodly smiling countenance. Masters, I here humbly submit me to the law as the law hath judged me, and as for mine offences I here accuse no man, God knoweth them. I remit them to God, beseeching him to have mercy on my soul, and I beseech Jesus, save my sovereign and master the king, the most godly, noble and gentle prince that is, and long to reign over you. Before I move on to telling you more about that tragic day, I just want to explain about execution speeches. If we dissect Anne's speech into parts, we have an acknowledgement that she had been condemned to death by the law, which she will say nothing against, prayers and praise for the monarch, a request for prayer, a request for mercy from God to whom she was commending her soul. And if we compare it to the speech Lady Jane Grey made in 1554, they're very similar. Here's what Jane is recorded as saying. Good people, I am come hither to die, and by law I am condemned to the same. The fact indeed against the Queen's Highness was unlawful and the consenting thereunto by me, but touching the procurement and desire thereof by me or on my behalf, I do wash my hands thereof in innocence before God and the face of you good Christian people this day. Now Jane didn't copy Anne, it's just that there was a standard model for execution speeches and in fact for death. In her thesis Performing at the Block, Scripting Early Modern Executions, Jennifer Lillian Ladine Chaffrey explains how executions, just like natural deaths, demanded set actions and speeches, and that a person's dying words were the sign of a good or bad death. She writes, in order to be classified as a good end, the deaths of executed individuals in the early modern era needed to attest to the power of the state, the divine justice of death, and the individuality of the condemned. She also explains that with a natural death, there was ritual and protocol that the dying person followed, if possible. They would express sorrow over the end of their life. They would pardon those gathered at their deathbed of any wrongdoing and also make amends for their own wrongdoing. Then they would turn to religion and pray. After prayer, they'd be absolved of their sins in preparation for their imminent death. And ritual was just as important when the death was by execution. In fact, beheading was a ritual in itself, as blood was seen as purifying, as a symbol of redemption. So the beheading could cleanse the victim of the sin that had led them to that end, in conjunction with their confession of guilt and prayers. Just as the person dying of natural causes tried to make amends and prayed, the person waiting to be executed was expected to make a scaffold confession 
and then request prayers for their soul from those present. An execution was also a public death, so the victim had to be seen as making a good end. What a scandal would be caused if they died badly. A prominent Tudor person would be very much aware that their speech and demeanour would be recorded and talked about. They couldn't let themselves or their families down. They would not want to blacken the family name and have their family suffer as a consequence. So what was the model or framework for a good death by execution? Well, a calm and dignified demeanour. An acknowledgement of the spectators, for example, good Christian people. And a reminder of why they are there. I am come hither to die. An acknowledgement that they had been judged to die by the law and had no argument with that. An admission of guilt and their sinful state, but not necessarily guilt of that particular crime. They would have believed that they were deserving of death because of original sin. And a warning to others to learn from them. A request for forgiveness. Prayers for the monarch. An expression of faith. So you can see that Anne was following the standard model. She wasn't admitting to being guilty of the charges laid against her. She was recognising that as a sinner, she deserved death. Back to the 19th of May, 1536. After her speech, the Queen paid the distressed swordsman of Calais and forgave him for his impending act. Blindfolded, she knelt, praying, O Lord, have mercy on me. To God, I commend my soul. To Jesus Christ, I commend my soul. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. The executioner, renowned for his skill, beheaded her with a single stroke. Her ladies, nearly overcome with grief, wrapped her body in a white cloth and transported her remains to the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula. There, her body and head were placed in an elm chest that was once used for bow staves, as no coffin was provided. Her remains were interred near her brothers in the chancel. Cannons were fired to announce her death to the people of London. In the early hours of that day, the Scottish theologian Alexander Eliseus had a vivid and terrifying vision. He immediately sought out Archbishop Thomas Cramner at Lambeth to share it. Cramner being his friend. Eliseus described his vision of the Queen's severed neck, noting he could count the nerves, the veins and the arteries. Cramner listened in silent wonder before saying, do you not know what is to happen today? When Eliseus responded that he was unaware, Cramner, raising his eyes to heaven, declared, she who has become the Queen of England upon earth will today become a Queen in heaven. Overcome with grief, Cramner could say no more and burst into tears. Later that day, Cramner, still grieving, had to issue a dispensation for Henry VIII to marry Jane Seymour. Henry and Jane were betrothed on the 20th of May, just a day after Anne's execution. And 10 days after that, they were married. Henry VIII couldn't wait to replace Anne. And that was the end of Queen Anne Boleyn, the woman Henry VIII had been so obsessed with. Little did he know that it was their daughter Elizabeth who'd rule over a golden age and be recognised the world over, rather than his son by Jane Seymour. Anne asked those who meddled in her cause to judge the best, and I think many of us do. Rest in peace, Queen Anne Boleyn. 